to me, it just says so much. And I want to broaden this out to Ukraine too, because where I live, I was seeing at the beginning of Russia, Ukraine, all these uh, flags on, you know, suburban right. homes for Ukraine. I'm not saying that's a bad thing necessarily, but I never saw them for Syria. I never saw them for Somalia. I never saw them for Afghanistan, uh, Yemen. It just seems to be, and this doesn't mean people are bad people, but they're subconsciously, <clears throat> let's put the flags in front of our houses for the white people in Ukraine, exactly. but not for the Palestinians in Gaza, not for the kids starving and being missiled at weddings in Yemen, and on and on. And I think people, especially the neoliberals, especially the conservatives, need to look at themselves and see, why do I have a different standard? Because when Russia was bombing uh, marketplaces or hospitals in Ukraine, Morning Joe was aghast. CNN oh, oh. was aghast. Right. The politicians were aghast, uh, and uh, rightly so. But this has been going on for six months. They're only aghast because Jose Andres, who I'm sorry, <clears throat> it's horrible what happened. I feel yeah. for their families. I feel for him. But he's kind of part of that celebrity limousine liberal crew. And kudos to him because he went after Biden. He went after uh, saying this was not an accident. And I'm not saying that was hard for him to do, but he's kind of part of that like limousine liberal class. So it just seems like they only care mm. when it was aid workers attached to a white celebrity chef, chef. Yeah, well, it's always, but, and here's, here's the thing for a lot of those people, and it's generally very privileged people uh, for the most part, like that, that we see with the Ukrainian flags and it, it is, it's a certain type of people. And <clears throat> even though they are so sanctimonious about it, and yeah, they're the ones that are at the end of the day, they're saying it matters more to me when white people die than when brown people die or whatever. But our media only feeds them that narrative, too. So, for example, our media was not properly covering what was going on in Yemen. Our media is not properly what's going on, covering what's going on right now in parts of northern Africa or, you know, or so many places because it doesn't sell right? Like it doesn't sell as much. It doesn't get as much clicks. It doesn't get as much, you know, donor class support to put out those messages. And so, oh, you know, over how many generations we just, we don't see them. Uh, you so know, I, I mean, it's a bunch it's, of things. It's, it's kind of surprising. I'd love your thoughts on this because for example, Homeland, the show on Showtime <coughs> was a hit, major hit. And it right. was all about us you know, assassinating and genociding brown people all over the world. Sure, there was some propaganda within it too, but I think that people would care about that. They're just not shown. They're not all people, but for the most part, yeah. I don't think people would, I, people, I think people would want to know and see if we're bombing, you know, weddings in Yemen or Somalia. Uh, they only see what the media wants us to see, which is a continuation of Cold War propaganda against Venezuela and name your communist or socialist country, but they're not seeing, uh, you know, all the genocides we have carried out or aided uh, in all these other countries. And I will say, uh, Colin, let's play. Even I just want to tell you another reason that I think that yeah. is, that why we see it in the places we see it, is that the places we see it are both economically and militarily advantageous for us to be involved in. And so we need to manufacture consent in certain places. That's what it's really about. It's about we manufacture consent when we need to be involved militarily. So if it doesn't really suit us in any way, we don't need to show that because we don't need to get people to care about, like, let's say the Sudanese. We don't need to care about the Sudanese. We need to care about Ukraine because it's a NATO situation. But we don't need to care about the Sudanese people because that doesn't benefit us. So we don't need to tell them that they're being massacred or whatever country. That's why. And I'd like to ask you, because in America, I mean, laws are kind of uh, flexible depending on who it is. But, you know, there are laws that if a doctor, you know, fucks up on surgery or malpractice, you could be sued. In some cases, you could even be criminal, uh, have criminal penalties. You know, if BP blows up the Gulf of Mexico, there will be fines and maybe uh, some penalties. But in this case, if, even if you wanted to give it, even if you wanted to give Israel the benefit of the doubt, which some do, which I will not, and say it's been just one tragic mistake after another, after a certain while, if you're giving all these bombs and weapons to people who repeatedly are making quote mistakes that are killing 
what is it, 32,000, 33,000, most of whom are women and children. At a certain point, well, maybe we need to pull money because these people aren't competent or they're yeah, not no, careful. So you're funding incompetence. Which is right. it? Are you funding Are you funding nefariousness or are you funding incompetence? Both. That's probably both. Like in all reality, it's probably both. But And I also question that number. Because, oh, no, I think it's a lot more. Yeah. Well, yeah. I've said this from the beginning. Forget that what the number is right now. The wheels have been put in motion for what I have said. I cannot fathom how we get out of this without two million dead people in the desert. So if somebody can explain to me how at this point, six months in, we're still arguing about terminology and as to who is or is not letting aid in and we're still arguing about this. These people are going to die at this point. The, the wheels are in motion, people. So that's the problem. So you could say whatever number it is now. But that, first of all, it does include people that are missing. And, and so who knows what that number is, which the idea that you at this point wouldn't include people that are missing is so stupid because where would they be? Right. So, you know, and, and so, no, I don't see how this is being without two million dead people. And, you know, what really kind of bothers me the most is the elephant in the room. Everyone is wondering, even, you know, um, people who are progressive, they're kind of playing dumb. Why is Biden willing to risk his presidency? Why is Biden willing to risk this? Risk mm -hmm. Anybody ever see who's funding his campaign? Jeffrey Katzenberg is his co-chair. Just happened to give $20 million to my old employer. But anyway, mm -hmm. Jeffrey Katzenberg, major Zionist, um, ha Haim Sabin, who did three fundraisers for him. He's the guy who kind of stole the Power Rangers from the Japanese and became a billionaire. He was one of Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and Harry Reid's top uh, donors forever and ever. A big Democratic Party bigwig yelled at Democratic politicians in 2018, I believe, during that uh, onslaught of Gaza, which was a lot less severe for condemning Israel. Well, he's given a lot of money to Biden and Biden is still in the 1980s mentally. Well, not mentally because he's kind of. We Mentally, not, I mean, uh, his philosophy is still in the 1980s <laughs> oh, of <yeah. clears throat> money, 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 money. That's the only way uh, we could compete. So to me, he's making the moral decision to, you know, I'll call this a war and to hell with the consequences. But I need to raise money from these people. And the bottom line is I'm saying this because it's true. And I follow money in <laughs> politics for a living. You could call it anti-Semitic if you want. But all you got to do is just look at the money. A lot of the big donors who donate to both politicians are either Jewish themselves or super Zionistic or both. And if Biden pulls money or puts conditions on that money, there's going to be he believes there's going to be hell to pay politically. Republicans will attack him. He'll lose independence, this and that. But at this point, you're losing a whole younger generation, not just for this election, but perhaps permanently. Uh, you're losing a lot of independent voters. Uh, so I think you're going to lose either way. Why not just do the right thing? Because they don't care. <laughs> there is that. They really don't care. And they also don't care if they lose because they win when they lose. And if Trump wins, they fundraise. And if he does, like this, we've talked about this so many times, the, the people in that class of people it doesn't matter to them one way or the other. The same corporations own them. They both are bought and paid for by the same level of whatever Zionist organizations or lobbying groups, whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. So what does he care if he loses? First of all, I don't think he really wants to sit there another four years. He can barely sit up now. So I, I think he'd be perfectly fine riding off into the sunset and, that, and just letting it be true. I really do. I don't think he cares.